and um, we very much welcome your input. So it would be a, uh, we would like to continue the dialogue forum that we had, the, especially the second half of uh, last week. Uh, it seemed to energize everyone, and mm -hmm. so hopefully that can continue. So the topic is the making of the United States. You see, what was responsible for the building of the United States in the period between independence and the Civil War? And we address this topic not as a historical curiosity, as a piece of antiquarian wisdom, but because of its direct pertinence to the debate about alternatives today, uh, as we hope to show. So I want to present and discuss with, with John and with you four sets of ideas. Uh, the first idea is a, a view, a controversial view, and a schematic view of what was responsible for the ascent of the United States in this early period. And my focus will be now on the North, on the United States in the North, on white society, uh, not on the slaveholding South, which was committed to free trade and slavery within the British imperial system mm -hmm. and was, in every respect, a different world, a world founded on violence, but paradoxically also committed to free trade, the export of commodities in this system. The discussion is of what made the United States from the base of the North until the country ran into the great conflict of the Civil War. And my thesis about this is that what was central to the making of the United States in this period was a dialectic, an interplay between two dynamics. From the top down, a project and agenda of national development, a national developmentalist agenda such as became familiar in the course of the 20th century. Uh, and from the bottom up, the selective democratization of what were then the two most important sectors of the American economy, agriculture and finance. Now, first on the developmental agenda, its great orchestrator was Alexander Hamilton. He was the ideologist of this national developmentalism. And we can distinguish in it four main components. The first component was the actual building of the country, the physical opening up of the United States through roads and canals, uh, later railroads, the construction of this infrastructure on a, on a national scale to literally build the country. Mm. And I should just add that the federal government helped profoundly in, in uh, subsidizing uh, the creation of a roads and canal network. Absolutely, it was the main orchestrator of every aspect of this agenda. And southern, the slave states refused federal money for that because they felt if the South was, uh, there was roads and uh, railroad networks created in the South, it would be easier for enslaved people to escape the plantation. The plantation was the center, the central power of Southern life, more than the state legislature. Who controlled things was the, the planter, the master of a plantation. The second component of this system was a high barrier of protectionism. The negation, the reversal of what prevailed in the South. The South accepted the prescriptions of the orthodox economists of then, as they would be of the orthodox economists today, mm -hmm. uh, uh, free trade, mm -hmm. and the development under free trade of Ricardian comparative advantage and the North erected this high trade barrier, which the United States maintained well into the 20th century until the, until the 1920s. 
was one of the most protectionist economies in the world, although you wouldn't guess it today right. by the <laughs> propaganda that the American statesmen make of the system of free trade. Yeah. Uh, they have now, after becoming rich, converted belatedly to the doctrines of the South. Yes, yes. Uh, the third component was the organization and manipulation of the public debt as the great instrument of public finance and investment in this developmental agenda. And the main vehicle for this was the Bank of the United States, the first and then the second Bank of the United States, mm -hmm. which not served not only the, the objective of promoting a class of rentiers, of beneficiaries of this debt, but investment, public investment, in especially in the development of infrastructure. <clears throat> and the fourth component, and perhaps the most important, was the definition of the cast of characters of the agents responsible for this developmental agenda. They were a combination of politicians, bureaucrats, buccaneers, uh, public functionaries of different kinds within <coughs> and outside the government. Mm -hmm. uh, an informal as well as a formal network of the promoters of this national developmentalism. Well, that's what I'm calling the movement from the top down. And, but that movement would not have formed the country that resulted were it not accompanied by a second movement. If that was all that had happened in the United States, there would have been very quickly a narrowing funnel of access to productive resources and opportunities. Mm -hmm. What expanded this funnel and therefore created the country that resulted was the interaction with this second dynamic in the two key sectors of the time, agriculture and finance. So let's take first agriculture. The belief of the conservatives and of the progressives or socialists at that time was that the process of agrarian concentration was inevitable. It was the inevitable road of progress. Uh, Marx later came to see it as an intrinsic feature of what he described as capitalism. And the English conservatives, the European conservatives, also believed in, in the necessity, in the inevitability of one or another form of agrarian concentration. The smallholders, the small farmers, the peasants would be driven out of the land and pushed into the cities to become then the labor force of the future mechanized industry which became industrial mass production. The Americans rejected this. Uh, and they, they had a different idea, taking advantage of their great natural resource of the agrarian frontier of abundant land. So first they distributed the land through the Homestead Acts, mm -hmm. uh, creating the physical basis for family scale agriculture. And then they took a series of initiatives that were designed to turn this family scale agriculture into a highly productive agriculture with entrepreneurial attributes. Uh, now, agriculture, family scale agriculture, is a unique economic activity which suffers from a unique kind of risk, which is the combination of physical volatility, climate risk, with economic volatility, price risk. So the historical experience of what happens to family scale agriculture is that eventually it succumbs in every society in the world unless something is done to provide an antidote to this unique combination of risks. And the antidote comes in the form of uh, food stockpiles, price supports, uh, agricultural income insurance, crop insurance, a whole panoply 
of legal and economic devices that are designed to neutralize these risks and stabilize the economic basis of family-scale agriculture. And then the, the government, both the national governments and the local governments, establish the land-grant colleges. And on the basis of the scientific knowledge developed in the land-grant colleges, then organize a system of agricultural extension to bring the insights of agricultural science to this farmer uh, and uh, uh, thereby allowing him to be highly productive mm -hmm. and to create this agriculture with uh, entrepreneurial attributes. Uh, uh, on this basis, of agricultural extension and the antidote to the peculiar risk of family-scale agriculture, the Americans organized the most productive system of family-scale agriculture with entrepreneurial attributes that had ever existed in the world mm -hmm. up to that point. And in today's vocabulary, not in the vocabulary of, of then, we might describe it using the following concept. We might say, they organize, in effect, a form of decentralized strategic coordination or partnership between the government, national and local governments, and the family farmer. Mm -hmm. And on the horizontal axis in the relations between the farmers, among the farmers, they organized what in today's vocabulary we would call cooperative competition. So the farmers were independent proprietors and entrepreneurs, but at the same time they pooled resources to achieve economies of scale. For example, they shared silos or mm -hmm. agricultural instruments and later machines. And they even shared labor working on one another's land at harvest time. That's cooperative competition. And this combination then of decentralized strategic coordination with cooperative competition prevented the supposedly inevitable process of agrarian concentration from occurring and created then the institutional framework within which this new kind of agricultural market could exist. And that was then, in this economy at that time, a tremendous force for the democratization of opportunity, uh, preventing the funnel of economic advantage from narrowing dramatically as it had in so many other societies. Now, the second sector then in which the Americans undertook a similar initiative was finance. I mentioned before the Hamiltonian project, the national development, used the organization of the public debt as its major financial instrument. But the public debt then became indirectly the instrument of enrichment of profit for this nascent plutocratic elite. And there was a conflict then over this use of the public debt and its major instrument, the Bank of the United States. And in the presidency of Andrew Jackson, mm -hmm. this conflict culminated in the dissolution of the bank, the second bank of the United States. For more than 100 years, the Americans prohibited any bank from operating in more than one state of the union. Right. Huh? Uh, at, oh, at the end of the 19th century, before this prohibition was formally lifted, the New York banks were in effect becoming national banks. That was the period of people like J.P. Morgan. But for a long time, they created this highly decentralized system of finance uh, at the disposal not only of the local consumer, but of the local producer. It was production-oriented, it was productivist in its orientation, and it too had never existed in the world in that form. No other country in modern history had created such a decentralized system of finance. 
So my initial conjecture then is that central to the ascent of the United States in, its, in this period in the North was this combination of the top-down national developmentalism with the selective democratization below. Now, I allow myself one theoretical remark at this stage in, in, our, in our discussion. When the Americans did this in agriculture and finance, they were not doing the two things that we are accustomed to do with market economies. They were not regulating because they, they were not regulating either the agricultural market or the financial market, and they were not redistributing. If by redistribution we mean retrospective tax and transfer through progressive taxation and redistributive social spending. So compensatory redistribution says the market as it exists is a tremendous motor for the creation of wealth. Unfortunately, it generates inequality. So we come after the fact, thus retrospectively, and we moderate the inequalities that it has generated through tax and transfer, progressive taxation and redistributive social spending. They were not doing either of those things. They were doing a third thing, which is the most important thing we can do with a market order. They were changing the institutional and legal architecture of the market. They were creating a type of agricultural market and of a financial market that had never existed before. And that was the crucial. Now, I want to say later that they didn't make explicit the unifying principle of these initiatives. And that, too, would have consequences. Mm -hmm. Just to build on your, those brilliant kind of architectural um, development that you um, described. One example of the significance of the Bank of the United States, especially this, the Second Bank of the United States, is when Jackson destroys the Second Bank of the United States, one of the functions of the bank is to regulate money. So each state had its own currency. And after the bank was destroyed, a number of states just printed more money to satisfy people in the state. So it was much harder to understand if you're exchanging from state to state what would happen. And it led to uh, what is now known as the Panic of 1837. And over the past 10 to 15 years, many scholars characterized the Panic of 1837 as at least as severe as the Great Depression. Uh, of prices plummeted, both in terms of currency and in certain goods, plummeted by 80, 90 percent. I mean, it was profound, and it was a direct result of this Jackson's abandoning a, a federal, essentially, banking system. So it, it, has to be, uh, it has to be emphasized that this dissolution of the Second Bank of the United States was a costly enterprise, yes. even for the progressives, yes. for, the, for the democratic forces, because in order to tie the hands of the nascent plutocracy, they had to tie their own hands. Yes. That is, they, they had to abandon this precious instrument of public investment which was the funded debt of the United States yes. through the bank. Yes. So it was not a costless enterprise. Yes. Uh, it was a blunt instrument yes. given what they understood to be the alternatives. You either have the bank or you don't have it. They didn't imagine all sorts of other ways in which the, the public debt and the money supply could have been reorganized. Yes. And they yes. paid the price for this primitiveness, so to speak. Yes. And I should add that this, the, the, um, the, the entrepreneurship, the, um, the, the kind of craft system that existed in the North um, was uh, available and was, uh, was engaged in by both women and African Americans. Uh, most Northern African Americans 
even if they were legally a fugitive, uh, had a, uh, whether they were a cooper or a blacksmith or a farmer, most of these artisans were farmers. But they were successful. They received, I mean, Lincoln famously said he's embracing this, this worldview in the North, uh, the, what he calls the free labor ideal. And Lincoln, and Lincoln was never an abolitionist. I mean, he was, had his own racism, to be sure. He advocated colonization. But he said, and this was true of most Northerners, I believe that everyone, including African-American women, as well as white women and men, have the, uh, in, should receive, have the ability to receive the fruits of their own labor. And the excess of the fruits, there is an, a, an extensive transportation network to sell your goods and buy others in the North. It was a truly successful artisanal movement that we'll get to the Civil War ends up Destroyed. Because that was the character of the economy in the North. It yes. was a, an economy of small scale proprietors, small scale, uh, yes. entrepreneurs, craftsmen, yes. artisans. Yes. Uh, again, to repeat, I believe that when Tocqueville visited the United States, only one white man in five worked for another white man. That's right. So this was essentially an economy of independent proprietors yes. and entrepreneurs. Right. Huh? Right. And then we have to ask later on, well, what, what? What happened to this? Why were they unable to build on this? Because it would have become, had it continued in this line, a very different country yes. from the country that it became after the Civil War. Right, uh, right. Uh, now, that, now I come then to the second idea. Uh, second idea is that this dynamic that I described, this dialectic, this interplay between the national developmentalism on top and the selective democratization below recurred later in American history, but ever weaker. Weaker in the mm -hmm. reconstruction after the Civil War, weaker in the early 20th century progressivism, weaker in the New Deal in a way, uh, weaker and weaker. And why was it weaker? That's the question on which I want to focus in the second idea. The the my thesis is that it was weaker because of the combination of two things. So the first thing was the weakness of democracy. The Americans had not organized a high energy democracy. All of the democracies that exist in the world today are to one extent or another flawed, weak democracies. They are democracies that continue to make change depend on crisis, on exogenous trauma in the form of war or economic collapse. And uh, therefore, as well, they are democracies that perpetuate what Thomas Jefferson had wanted to avoid, which is the rule of the living by the dead. Mm. Huh? Those, are, those are the weak democracies. Mm. So, and the Americans in particular were an extreme form of this weakness because what they organized under the leader, under their revered framers, was this system of proto democratic liberalism. It wasn't a real democracy, it was full of counter majoritarian qualifications. And these qualifications were even more overt than they have since become because of the property qualifications to the suffrage, for example that existed at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, and the constitutional architecture that the Americans designed, as I suggested in an earlier class, was based on the premise that the liberal principle of fragmentation of power was inseparable from the conservative principle of the slowing down of politics. So Madison's scheme of checks and balances resulted in this inhibition on the usage of political power to transform society, especially to transform the economic order. Yeah. And this wasn't an accident. It was intended to be that. Yeah. It was intended to protect this natural order of the market from political attack. And subsequently, the Americans, as you all know, came to believe 
that the liberal principle of the fragmentation of power was naturally and necessarily inseparable from the conservative principle of the slowing down of politics. They are mistaken in this belief, mm -hmm. but that's what they believe because it's easy to show that there are any number of constitutional mechanisms by which it would be possible to keep the liberal principle of fragmentation of power, but get rid of the conservative principle of the slowing down of politics. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the consequence is this, uh, this impediment to the, to the deepening of democracy that has ever since existed in the United States. And uh, uh, the result is, is the hierarchies of class society could harden under this system and be relatively insulated from political attack. So that was the first force that weakened the recurrence of that dynamic, of that interplay between national developmentalism on top and selective democratization below. The second was the weakness of thought. So I said the first is the weakness of democracy, the second is the weakness of thought. And the weakness of thought begins in a failure to render explicit the principles underlying those innovations in agriculture and finance. What is the general principle that they both embody? The general principle is that a market order has no natural and necessary form. There is no single way of organizing a market order. Um, now, later in the evolution of legal thought, of 19th century legal thought, there would be a way in which the Americans, the American jurists, discovered uh, the this 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 fact, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try and state the, the nature of this legal discovery in the following way. The, the belief of classical legal science in the early 19th century was that if you start with the idea of a market economy on top, economic decentralization, classical forms of contract and property, you can begin to infer from these abstractions at each level down, more concreteness. That is, you can unpack the idea of the market. You can deduce from the abstractions more and more concrete rules. What the Americans discovered in the course of the 19th century was that at each step down the ladder of concreteness, there were choices to be made. It wasn't evident which way of of making it more concrete, you took. And then at each step, the choice, as people like Oliver Wendell Holmes discovered and announced, depended on conflict of interest and vision. You couldn't resolve the problem by referring back to the abstractions and deducing from them the right solution. You had to take a stance in some conflict of interest. This idea of the relative indeterminacy or ambiguity of the rules being made more and more concrete could have led them or should have led them to the discovery of the pluralism of the plurality of the possible forms of market order. But it didn't. Mm. They didn't take that jump. So the general principle was never developed. And then you know the rest of the story. So the rest of the story is there are these classical theories like Marxism, classical European social theory. They say there are these fateful structures in social life like feudalism, capitalism. E but each of them is an indivisible system. It's a predetermined package. You open the package and it comes with its own content. So you get to choose which type of society you'll be. But once you choose, for example, you choose to use Cardozo's phrase, the scheme of ordered liberty, you don't get to choose the content. The package comes with a pre-established <laughs> content. That was their idea. And uh, so there's this structural determinism, which then 
re drastically reduces the options for society. Uh, and today, in the contemporary social sciences, you have the afterlife of that same idea. As you all know, uh, by studying here at Harvard University, where there is a relentless campaign in favor of the suppression of structural vision and the imagination of structural alternatives. So the combination of these two things then, the superstitious character of thought, the, the, the retrospective rationalization of the institutional arrangement, as if they were the emanation or the halo of the natural form of a market order, with the weakness of democracy, the proto-democratic liberalism, then suffices to explain the ever greater weakness of the virtuous dynamic to which the, to which the Americans owe their national greatness. That's very good. Just to <laughs> build on what you've said, uh, let me give a, a few examples of one, uh, Madison's uh, notion of the weakness of democracy within this ar northern artisanal system, uh, and that is that Southerners, it was a, a, a racial feudalism. They, were they, they generated much more money. It, the first big business was cotton on plantations. And Southerners sold and make, got hugely rich by selling cotton and other slave-grown products to England, France, essentially to Europe, uh, who purchased them. Northerners, the artisanal system in the North was such that England and Europe sent uh, goods uh, to the United States, and the Northern artisans could not compete as well with these larger industrial uh, orders in Europe, and so Northerners wanted a tariff. They wanted protection for these millions, these countless artisans making shoes, making coats, making shirts, making dresses, as well as agricultural products. And because of the, um, the uh, Southerners se selling their cotton, to European, because of northern tariffs, the Europe imposed tariffs, which reduced the profitability of southern cotton and other goods. And it came to a crisis in which John C. Calhoun, the kind of the leading uh, pro-slavery southerner, um, passed a, a, a nullification or, or advocated for nullifying a federal tariff, which technically is a form of economic secession, essentially saying, I'm going to ignore this federal tariff that's in place that led almost to warfare, uh, although it didn't. But it's one of the many uh, instances of, um, and it's all, it was always Southerners from the Constitution until the Civil War, Southerners in part because of this d profoundly different economic system saying, if we don't like want our way, we're out. That was the, the a main um, a main threat uh, that Southerners uh, posed, um, and uh, I would uh, then also um, uh, mention. I mean, Roberto and I discussed this before class. Is that um, it's important to understand that in this, um, until the end of the Civil War, uh, there were very, very few corporations, which is a very different form of finance than an artisanal system. An artisanal system, as Roberto said, is a, is a, a family order. Uh, a, uh, a corporate form of organization is that the, uh, the owners of the corporations are shareholders. And it's a way to create a huge amount of money and control a large number of things by creating a, a corporation rather than independent artisans. And f until after the Civil War, 
because, um, because statesmen, particularly um, Northern and the statesmen who were invested in this artisanal system, recognized the profound threat of enabling or allowing corporate charters. And until the end of the Civil War, there were one, very few corporations, and in order to, uh, to acquire a corporation, you needed the buy-in of the entire community members. Uh, and the function of the corporation had to explicitly be for the good of the whole. So the Charles River Bridge case was a classic example that led to a corporate charter because the bridge would benefit everyone around the Boston area to be able to go over the bridge rather than a huge detour around the river. And there were numerous examples of uh, the government prohibiting corporate charters because it would only benefit a few people. Um, so those are some examples that capture the truly extraordinary um, artisanal system in the North that worked very well. Um, and uh, in fact, if any of you have read uh, Harry Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, Stowe actually has a, a brief nonfiction aspect in her novel where she had lived in Cincinnati and she gives a list of the African Americans in Cincinnati, and at this time each city had a business manual that described the job and the income of that individual, and listed the net worth and the income of these African American artisans, and they were middle to upper middle, if not upper class. And that's not to say that Cincinnati was void of racism, but one of the virtues of the artisanal system is that you can define your small company or your trade independent from people who are your enemies. They need not destroy what you're doing. It truly is a, um, hence the term artisanal. So I want to go there uh, to this next point. Uh, is exactly my third, my third idea. But before that, I want to go back for a moment to the proto-democratic liberalism yeah. and just uh, make, point out that the, the, the consequence of the proto-democratic liberalism is to establish a kind of correspondence between the transformative ambition or reach of any political project and the severity of the constitutional obstacles that it has to overcome. Mm -hmm. That's what it does. Mm -hmm. and, and so, go into the 20th century, we're going to discuss next week, Franklin Roosevelt. He had, as his allies, the biggest war in the history of the world and the biggest economic collapse in modern history. Mm -hmm. And even then he had trouble, because the system was designed to give him this trouble. Yeah. It was designed to throw sand into the wheels to prevent transformation. That, that was not a kind of subproduct. It was the, in, the intentional object of the exercise to prevent this natural economic order from being attacked. Now, my third idea then, and, and the fourth idea, is it's very simple. Into the vacuum created by the failure of that dialectic to recur in American history, uh, the dialectic between the national developmentalism and the selective sector-specific democratization, what steps into the vacuum is the corporation, mm -hmm. corporate power, and corporate power later married to high finance, mm -hmm. high finance helping to organize corporate power, as in the trusts of the late 19th century. And the most significant transformation that happened in the development of the corporation and of corporate law in the 19th century was this. The corporation, like every other feature of a market economy, is an invention of the state. 
There is no natural market economy. There's one or another kind of market economy. And all of the instruments of the market economy are creations, political creations, creations of the law. One of those creations is the corporation. The corporation is based on a charter given by the state mm -hmm. for it to operate under corporate form. And one of the most important benefits of this charter is limited liability. Right. And the classic idea in corporate law was you get the favor of limited liability in exchange for performing a public mission. Mm -hmm. So the momentous change that happened in the evolution of corporate law was that the public mission was suppressed. Uh, it, it, it became accidental or automatic. Uh, and the favor of limited liability was conceded in effect in return for nothing right. other than the accumulation of money. Right. And that's what then would occupy this vacuum. And then at the 19th century, we have this domination of American life by the corporations uh, married to high finance under the benign eye of the national government, which is promoting their marriage. Right. Which you see immediately um, after the Civil War, uh, in which um, it becomes much, much easier to receive a corporation. And as Roberto said, it, any um, inspired businessman who wants to get wealthy can create a corporation when it's not no longer seen as um, as uh, is helping the community at large uh, or the state at large. It encourages people to widely speculate because if they lose everything, uh, their liability is limited only to what they put into the corporation, uh, which is why the antebellum form of corporation. There were very few corporate charters issued. You could count almost on, you know, t well, a few more than 10 fingers. But suddenly, uh, after the Civil War, corporate charters were available to any financier, anyone who had a get-rich-quick scheme. Um, and to this day, virtually the vast majority of corporations are issued out of Delaware because Delaware realized um, that will tax people less for the corporations, will make money as the state, and will compete with other states for corporate charters, which is why most corporations are um, based in Delaware. Uh, and, uh, and it's a profound, uh, a profound transformation in the sense that um, it, the, another aspect of the corporation is the corporation is seen, is, is a given, and this is as early as 1886, just 20 years after the Civil War. The corporation came to be seen and having the same 14th Amendment protection as people. And it was in a case called Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad. Santa Clara County had been taxing land and the rights of way of the Southern Pacific Railroad. Southern Pacific Railroad refused to pay any taxes to the county for six years. And on the property with a $30 million mortgage, the railroad refused to pay just a modest 30 grand. It's like having a $10,000 car and refusing to pay a $10 tax on it. And this case goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. And Southern Pacific Railroad lawyers argued that corporations are persons entitled to equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment. In fact, they said, I mean, as you know, the clause is no state shall make or enforce any law which shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor to, not to deny any person within its jur jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. Southern Pacific Railroad wins the case. And that is, has established a precedent that exists to this day for corporations enjoying constitutional protections that the founders, uh, the artisans, 
the, the, the Lincoln Republicans um, were, uh, would have been outraged and shocked by. Um, and uh, so that, and we are still with that um, today. Uh, which means that when, when that happens, the whole concept of the artisanal system, the free labor ideal that every Republican, and it was truly a northern party. And in fact, um, because of the nature of the South, if you were a Republican and you went into the slave states and championed the Republicanism, your life was in danger. Many people were tarred and feathered. Some people were murdered. Lincoln didn't receive a single vote in, a, in the southern states, not a single vote. And had Lincoln gone into the South to campaign, he would have been lynched. I mean, it truly was a separate feudal aspect of uh, the United States. Um, and uh, so the, the, this free labor ideal with the rise of the corporation is becomes totally destroyed. And you see that immediately. Um, uh, so in fact, Lincoln specifically says, this is in one of his speeches, he says, labor is prior to and independent of capital. Capital money is important, but the real, the real um, benefit and joy is the labor itself. Um, the process, the creation itself. Yes, you want to make a living, but the labor is prior and more important than the capital. Capital is only the fruit of the labor and could never have existed if labor had not first existed. Again, I'm quoting Lincoln. Labor is the superior of capital and deserves much higher consideration because in an artisanal world, each person gets to choose their craft, something that they love, something that they can immerse themselves in, something that makes them grow intellectually, emotionally, physically as humans, rather than focusing simply on capital. And this free labor ideal encouraged that, encouraged every man and woman, black and white, to discover what it is that he or she loved to do. And in the North there were, so for example, I mean something I've written on a fair amount, and, and um, it, photography. It, ph photography was a, a new invention. It was, uh, and Americans fell in love with photography in ways that no one else in the world did because it, for the first time ever, someone could obtain a portrait of himself or herself that was more accurate, more detailed than anything that had ever come before. And it reflected this vision of democracy. And anyone could become a photographer. All you needed to do is learn, if you knew how to read and read a manual, the supplies did not cost that much. Many photographers had a wagon and they go from town to town satisfying the insatiable demand. I mean, that's a, one of the many crafts and there were many like that. They were successful free laborers. Um, examples of uh, the free la labor ideal. But by the 1880s, the capital is th then seen as superior to labor. Rutherford B. Hayes, who was Republican uh, comparatively for his time, progressive, announces uh, that the government is for corporations. This is a quote from him. This is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people no longer. Is it, it is a government of corporations, by corporations, and for corporations. Radical shift from the artisanal ideal to the corporate ideal. And now then I come to my fourth idea which is completely different in nature from the other three because the fourth idea is a programmatic idea. And this is the idea that I think has greatest pertinence to our debates today. So let me first try and set up this discussion. It's more complicated than the discussion of the historical matters that we have been addressing up to now. So we see the United States in the north in the night in the in the early 19th century, in the period between independence and the Civil War, as an economy of 
proprietor, as of artisans, craftsmen, uh, a decentralized economy. Mm -hmm. And in this respect, the United States is like other countries of English settlement, especially the countries of late English settlement like Canada, uh, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand. In each of those, those countries, there was a very strong presence of this idea of the yeoman, the, right, the right. small proprietor, the small time entrepreneur. Right. And this social reality, later even in the 20th century, uh, inspired the creation of social movements and political parties like the social credit movement in Canada to organize uh, and give political power to this world, to this world of independent uh, economic initiative. Uh, then after the Civil War in the United States, we have this radical change of direction. Uh, with the corporation, the instrument of money, and with the vast flows, of migratory flows from Europe, of Im European immigration, we have the concentration of the economy and the formation of these great combines, these combinations of economic power. And we get a different world, a world in which workers are assembled into large productive units, like factories, under the aegis of large corporate entities. So here's the question. Why were the Americans unable to repeat the trick that they did with respect to agriculture? So in agriculture, they had rejected the, the inevitability of agrarian concentration. And through innovations in the architecture of the agricultural market, they had created the basis for a form of agriculture that was both decentralized and economically progressive. It was just as productive, as productive or more productive than any other agriculture in the world. But when then the problem was generalized to the economy as a whole on a much larger scale, they were unable to repeat this achievement. So, and all the liberals and socialists of the 19th century, the John Stuart Mills, the Karl Marxes, the, the the Abraham Lincolns, right. uh, they had this idea that free work was, above all, self-employment and cooperation. Mm -hmm. Those were the two higher forms of free labor. The third form, wage labor, was deficient. It, it bore many of the traits of slavery and serfdom, and it was destined to be overcome. No one would deliberately choose it. But those liberals and socialists, those friends of free labor and of the decentralized economy, were unable to show how their commitments to free labor and to economic decentralization could be reconciled with the relentless imperative of economies of scale. Mm. Uh, they failed to do that. They failed to develop the institutional architecture that could have provided the basis for that combination. Right, right, right. And that's the, that's the issue that I want to speak to now. Yeah. So in order to introduce that issue, uh, I want to begin with an abstraction, which is the idea of the market economy, because we're, after all, we're talking about the organization of a market order. And why is it that a market order can have no natural and necessary form? So let's take the idea of the market even to the highest level of abstraction and generality. And imagine that at this level of abstraction and generality, a market order has at least two dimensions. One dimension is the absolute level of economic decentralization. That is, the number of economic agents able to bargain on their own initiative and for their own account. That's one of the elementary things we must mean by a market economy. But there's a second dimension. The second dimension is the absoluteness of the control that each of those agents enjoys over the resources at his command. Is that control absolute in relation to the interests of other people? And is it eternal 
Is it something that, for example, he can transmit through gifts or through inheritance? Mm -hmm. Or is it temporary, fragmentary, and conditional? That's the second dimension of the market. Now, the dogmatic, classical, liberal idea of the 19th century was that these two dimensions that I've just described, the dimension of absolute decentralization and the dimension of absolute control, go together naturally and necessarily. But it's quite obvious that they don't go together naturally and necessarily. Because one of the ways in which, in principle, you might be able to increase the level of absolute decentralization is by qualifying the absoluteness of the control. For example, saying that you have a fragmentary claim to some productive resources, a derivative of the property right. So the classical property right is a unified power. It's really an invention of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. The normal form of property in most periods of legal history, in most legal traditions, is the disaggregation of the property right into distinct powers that are then vested in different right holders, each of which then has some partial claim on those resources. So European feudalism, for example, is, a, is an instance of the disaggregation of the property right. Modern financial markets, you know, are markets in derivatives of the property right like options contracts, calls and puts. What are they? They are markets in, literally, components of the property right that have been disaggregated. Mm -hmm. So unified property is a bundle of powers, and that bundle can be opened and its components vested in different powers. In the civil law, we, we, we say that the three component powers of property are the use of the object, the usufruct, which is the claim to the income stream it generates, and the right of alienation, to buy and sell. And these components are not necessarily vested in the same right holder, the, the same owner. They can be disassembled and vested in different claimants. That's the simple idea in the, in the vocabulary of the civil law of the disaggregation of the property right. So there's no, it's not true that these two dimensions of the market go together. So what would be necessary then to reconcile this great economic decentralization that existed in the early 19th century with aggregation of resources at scale? It would be to complicate the, the legal organization of the market so that alongside the traditional property right, there would be another kind of property in which people would have temporary or conditional or fragmentary claims on those productive resources. Now, let me make clear, the unified property right will always have a place in a, in, in a market order. It has a great advantage. The great advantage of the unified property right, classic property, the property invented in the 19th century, is that it allows someone, the entrepreneur, to do at his own risk something that no one else believes in. That's the advantage of absolute property. It's a way of avoiding the need to win consent uh, or to lift the possible vetoes that opposing interests would have. You have your own property, you do what, it, what you will, you take a risk. Frank Knight, conservative economist, said, the historical justification of capitalism, using Marx's term, capitalism, is the existence of a class of people who are willing to pay a premium for the privilege of running a risk. That's the justification of the unified property right. But the property right should, that property right shouldn't be the only form of the organization of a market order. The mar right. There should be many alternative regimes of property and contract coexisting experimentally within the same market order. Now, just to suggest what I mean, let me propose a thought experiment to make clear the radicalization of this principle and how it would apply to this problem we're considering of reconciling decentralization with scale. 
Imagine the following system. The main productive resources of society. Uh, liquid capital and technological apparatus. Rather than being owned absolutely and perpetually by private individuals, and rather than being controlled by the state, are vested in a series of independently managed public trusts. So these trusts are, it's not government, central governmental allocation. These trusts hold the productive resources of society, and they operate under different regimes, with different time horizons, with different rules, so that after the fact, we can compare experimentally the results and decide which to promote and which to phase out. And these trusts then conduct a rotating capital auction. So any team of producers, of entrepreneurs, of artisans that can plausibly claim that can give the trust the highest rate of return for the use of those productive resources gets to use them temporarily. Uh, so there, that's what I mean by capital auction. There's a permanent auction of the productive resources of society. No one owns them in per perpetuity. So playing with Marx's terminology of capitalism, we could call this capitalism without capitalists. Because there are no capitalists. There are no permanent owners. Uh, they're just the users of these productive resources. Now, that's the radicalization of this idea. And by the way, let me point out the fact. In orthodox economic theory, in finance theory, in a sense, this supposedly radical experiment that I'm describing is what already exists. Mm -hmm. That is, orthodox finance theory says that a perfectly competitive capital market allocates capital to its most productive uses and users. And theoretically, it doesn't matter who initially the owners of the assets are, because the assets will end up in the hands of their most efficient users by the normal operation of the capital markets. That's what the orthodox theory says. And so what the thought experiment I'm describing to you does is it says, we won't take that in faith, that rotation, that auction, will set up a system to ensure that what the theory claims to happen automatically, in fact, happens. We'll make it happen. And that's the way in which we'll do it. Now, short of this radical outcome, there are any number of parcel approximations that are much less radical, but that go in this same direction of making, of disassembling the property right and of making these claims on the productive resources of society fragmentary, conditional, or temporary. And that's how we would reconcile this economic decentralization with economies of scale. That's what would be involved. So the generic operation is we reimagine the market order, we begin to experiment with its legal and institutional form, and the most important way in which we do that is by limiting absoluteness for the sake of decentralization. And if the Americans had done that, or if they did that today, then they would stand a much better chance of repeating the trick that they did with regard to agriculture in the early 19th century. Hmm. Could you, are, th are there examples of that successful examples of that happening? Well, there's no developed example, of course. There's yeah. no developed example. Right. But as I say, the disaggregation of the property right is not a mystery right. because right. it's what happens. Right. That's the basis of contemporary financial markets. Right. We're going to discuss the New Deal next, next week. And one of the things that happened in the New Deal in its second phase was the organization of the market. Of of the mortgage market uh, and the quasi-governmental organizations, enterprises, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which then became the vehicle for the organization of the mortgage market. And then there was the organization of the secondary mortgage market. The, mortgage, the mortgages were securitized and sold. 
And that became the main basis for the capital deepening in the United States. Now, that's an example of the disassembling of the property rights. Mm -hmm. And it, it had the benefit of giving access to a class of assets, in this case, housing, very, very important to the population. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have these fragmentary examples all over in China. Uh, there's a, a, a world of, of institutional anomalies or innovations designed to reconcile state control with the market order, and they go in the same direction. So all over the world, we have this micro-experimentalism. The micro-experimentalism is not harnessed to the kind of project that I just described, but it exists. It's the raw material. It's the Brownian motion on the basis of which we could construct these more ambitious experiments. But the fundamental argument I'm making, the, the, the programmatic argument, is that the process of concentration that we witnessed in the late 19th century is certainly the path of least resistance. It is the way of dealing with the economic challenge that least disturb the established interests and the ruling preconceptions. But it's not necessary because there are alternatives. The alternatives always require some higher level of institutional innovation and therefore as well a reinterpretation of the interests and ideals of particular classes. So this is not some kind of magic blueprint. Uh, and so, and the presupposition of this is a complete alternative to the Marxist view of class interests. Mm -hmm. So in the Marxist view of class interests, classes have objective interests. Mm -hmm. And the more intense class conflict becomes and the broader its scope, the more perspicuous the objective content of the class interests also becomes. The price of making a mistake about your class interest in Marxist theory is defeat, political defeat. Now, the premise of this other idea of class interest that I implying in my institutional experiment is the exact opposite of that. It says the supposed objectivity of class interest is the mendacious semblance of a situation of stagnation. It's when there isn't a conflict over alternatives. Because the broader the conflict over alternatives, structural alternatives, such as alternatives in the organization of the market, the more the question, what are my interests as a member of a certain class, becomes inseparable from the answer to the question, what are the alternatives in the space of the adjacent possible or approximate set? Who would I become? under these alternatives, and what would then be my interests and my, my identity? So the intensification and the broadening of conflict, rather than making the class interests more perspicuous, confuses the class interests with the debate about alternatives. Right. That's what happened. Huh? And, and this is relevant in the United States because in the United States, as in many countries around the world, the main social group is not what Marx called an industrial proletariat. That's a shrinking part of the labor force. It's a mass, it's a disorganized mass of people, more or less poor, right. with a petty bourgeois horizon. They're not necessarily small entrepreneurs and craftsmen and farmers as they were in the 19th century. But the horizon of aspiration is to this modest prosperity and independence. Right. That's the sense in which I'm saying they're subjectively petty bourgeois, even if they're not objectively petty bourgeois. Right. And then the then the and if there is no if there are no economic alternatives that can satisfy this aspiration they then gravitate to the default object of aspiration, which is isolated, archaic, regressive family business. To have your own plot of land, to have your little store, to have your garage shop or whatever. Mm -hmm. 
because that's by default the the target of this petty bourgeois aspiration. Right. If we fail to provide other ways of responding to it, which we could. So uh, my question for you and, uh, is this um, extraordinary reimagining of the market order that you've sketched out. Do you think that's that's possible or viable or doable in the United States without revising the nature of the corporation and a corporate charter? What's the, uh, yeah, w w to what degree does so the I think current this existence of the corporate charter get in the way of this uh, reimagining of, of, of implementing this new market order? So I th to me, that's not, that's not a, a, an immediately attractive way of thinking about a transformation, okay. right? Because we're, we're thinking about the impediment. So, right. And I think there's a scale. So my question is, what's on the other side of the scale? Right. What's on the other side of the scale is some idea of an alternative right. and some direction. Uh, of, and then this impediment is more or less significant in relation to that, in, in relation to what's weighing on the other side of the scale. Right. So what I would say is if we were able, for example, simply to uh, destroy many of the corporations, for example, by the radicalization of antitrust law yes, yes. or the development of new forms of governance, we wouldn't by that fact alone have advanced toward this alternative. Right, but there needs to be a certain uh, a large number of people advocating for this alternative mm -hmm. and um, can you have a this this transformation it really an ideology and in, in view so the subject now in a country like the United States uh -huh. and in most of the advanced economies that provides the focus for this debate right. is this question of the knowledge economy. So right, right. Uh, conventional industry, the right, Rust Belt right. industries are in decline. Right. They're not going to come back. Right. Uh, all we can do is buy them a few more years right. through defensive measures. Uh, but at the same time now, there's this new economy. We shouldn't identify it just with advanced manufacturer, much less with the platform oligopolies of Silicon Valley. This new economy exists in every part of the production system, in intellectually dense services and precision of scientific agriculture, as well as in advanced manufacture. But in every sector, it's just a fringe, which excludes the vast majority of workers and of firms. Yeah. And instead of deepening and spreading throughout the production system, the opposite has happened. It's become more and more insular. It's become more and more insular because the entrepreneurs and firms that control it have discovered a way to bifurcate it into two parts. A part which is commoditized and formulaic, which they then subcontract to firms and workers in other parts of the world, this global system of tax and labor arbitrage, and then the creative and lucrative part, which they keep for themselves. So. There are mm -hmm. tens of thousands of people working at, Fo at Foxconn mm -hmm. in, in uh, Western China, uh, in Eastern China, with, with in what is essentially like a Fordist industrial operation. Mm -hmm. And then in California, there are a few thousand people who have all the fun and all the profit. Mm -hmm. That's the hyper-insular form of the knowledge economy. So. The, the, the crucial contemporary question is how the vast rear guard can be lifted up mm -hmm. little by little in every sector. Right, right. And that would then be the industrial equivalent to this 19th century procedure right, right. of agricultural extension. That's where the conflict would be today. But in that conflict, the reinvention of the market order, mm -hmm. step by step, stage by stage, would be a crucial part. Right. So it's, it's not just a regional question. You know, you can ask uh, 
why isn't there a knowledge economy in North Dakota? But it's much more fundamental to ask, why isn't there a knowledge economy in the rest of the industrial system or the agricultural system or the system of services? So we, and now in these economies, it's not just workers connected to big enterprises. It's a huge part of the population which is fragmented and disconnected from any business enterprise. So the system of, of uplift, of, of extension, would have to come to them as well as to the businesses. So we have to take these people, like the machine repair person or the nurse practitioner, and transform them into technologically equipped artisans. Mm -hmm. That's this mm -hmm. process of uplift. Right. Now, that would have to repeat this, the virtuous dynamic that created the United States in the first place right, in right. the early 19th century right, right. that I described at the outset of our conversation. Right. And then when we did that, we would face the same two obstacles, right. which I said were responsible for the weakening of that dynamic, right. which are the weakness of democracy and the weakness of thought. Right. And we would have to address that before we attempted to slay the corporation as the main enemy. But not slaying it, but in the 19th century, corporations had, there were, there were far more restrictions on what a corporation could do and become. As the reverse side of the corporate charter. Exactly. The, 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 the favors of limited liability. That's right. Huh? That's right. So we would have reason to reinvent these legal principles. That's right. Giving them a new sense. That's right. So it would return the corporation to the... To, to, to its public mission. To its public mission. Exactly. Which is, I mean, frankly, that is a radical transformation of the corporation vis-a-vis -vis yes. where it is today. Yes, and because I think the tendency of Americans in every field is to think that public means governmental. Right, right. And it doesn't mean governmental. Right, right. Because the idea is, we're, as in this idea of the trust that I described, yes, yes. as the repositories of the productive assets of society, they're not the government. Right. They're not uh, allocating by discretionary allocation. They're a third sector. They're not the market as it's presently constituted, and they're not the state, but they hold in trust those assets, mm -hmm. and, they, and they auction them off. Right, huh? right, right. Uh, so that's not the state. And what happens now in every debate in the United States is that if I propose to you, or to say someone like say Larry Summers, if I if I propose to him <laughs> a different way of organizing the market, like the proposal I just made, <laughs> their their first instinct is to say, but that's radically interventionist. So so they identify the market with a market that they know. Right. Huh? Right, right, and, right. And so their idea is but that it is, I, it's <laughs> radical for them. <laughs> their idea is that another market is somehow an intervention, yeah, as yeah. if the existing market were not an intervention. Right, the existing right, market right. is a creation of the law, right. a creation of the state, all of its entities yes. like the corporation, yes. like the established forms of contract and property. Yes. So it's not as if there were any form that were natural, but right. this idea of naturalness dies hard in the United States. So for example, there is an American constitutional law as whoever is a lawyer here knows, something called the state action doctrine. And the state action doctrine distinguishes for a whole range of purposes situations in which the government is complicit in the creation of the situation with others that are somehow just there naturally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what you have to say is that there are no situations in society which is somehow just naturally there. Mm. There is no natural market order. There is no natural system of property and contract. Everything is a choice, a creation, mm. an artifact. Mm. Uh, and we don't get to choose between the natural and the artifactual. We, we have only the artifact. Mm. And the real choice that is being made here, as in this imaginary debate that I pictured with my interlocutor, is the choice between the artifacts that we're accustomed to and the ones that are new. Right, 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 right. That's very good. Yes. I'm really fascinated by this idea of Can you speak up a little bit? I'm fascinated by this idea of restoring corporations to its 
public mission. I'm curious how you would relate or distinguish um, current trends around B corporations, ESG, all these sort of movements of companies either saying or actually um, that their companies are starting to work with the public good in mind, not just the bottom line. Mm. Do you want to speak to that, John? Uh. I'm, I think that's a very good point. I'm, I'll let you speak, but I would uh, or say something. I, just, I think that there is, um, I'm, I'm actually very heartened by that trend, I should say. And um, I would like to see it um, expand and, and mobilize it at a far greater speed and, um, and breadth than it has. I think th um, that there's, I think there's real hope in that trend. So I'm not so heartened by that You're trend. You're not. No, I'm <laughs> like you. Uh, I think this is a kind of sugar coating. Uh, I, don't want okay. the, I don't want the purposes of society, of the economy, to be chosen by the pietistic managers. That is, I don't want the rich people who are in control of these corporations to say, well, there's the environment, or there's this, or there's that. So we'll soften what we're doing. If there is a social objective, it should be imposed by the law. It shouldn't be free for them to decide on the basis yeah, of yeah, yeah. And the real object here is not to add s some list of values on the other side that should constrain what we're doing. It's reorganizing the legal and institutional architecture of the market order. Yeah, that's, so that's, that's, I agree. That's the I agree real object. That. I agree it's not with saying, that. You know, it's like the traditional motto of Harvard Business School was make profit with a conscience. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want them to make profit. But I want them to make profit. That's good for society. Yeah. And then the constraints under which they do that, we impose on them by force. That's what the citizens do through their democratic institutions. Yeah. We don't want them to read the New York Times and select the pieties of the day uh, to guide their, their entrepreneurial operations. But if the if the corporation if if there's a, um, a continued evolution or revision of the corporation, I think it needs to be it needs to be codified in law. It needs to of needs course to, yes. codified in law and then imposed. Imposed, right? Yeah. So in that sense, there needs to, that needs to be a, a but what a I think is to be feared is the the canonization of a set of uh, pieties of the day, huh? yeah, which then. Uh, uh, re release us from the obligation of transforming anything, but provide this sugary cover right. on the on the operation of the existing system. I don't want the richest men in the United States to be choosing for me what the objectives are. I want uh, the citizens to choose them for themselves and then impose them. But before there's there's structural change. Well, there are two ways for structural change to occur. One is from the top down, the, the uh, politicians implementing structural change based on either their perception of what the electorate wants, and, or in some cases, um, uh, uh, their, the majority. So, I would, so I think that this is an interesting feature now of, of the United States, the American political culture, this small business class, right? Yeah. And I made this distinction between objective petty bourgeois and right. subjective petty bourgeois. Right. So this, I, I think that the objective petty bourgeois, the small business class, in the strict sense, is of course a minority, right. a small minority in every country. Right. But I think that the subjective petty bourgeoisie is the majority of humanity. Right, uh, right, right. Because most people are not associated with large-scale business organizations in any economy in the world. Right. And we have this fragmented mass in various stages of disorganization who aspire to this, what I call modest prosperity and independence. That's the majority of every society in the world. The traditional constituency of the left-leaning parties, uh, Marxist movements and so forth, is the organized labor force headquartered in the capital-intensive sectors of the economy. In every country in the world today, that's a shrinking minority. Right, right. 
which is seen and comes to see itself as just one more special interest alongside the other special interest, not as the bearer of the universal interest of humanity. So that's what I'm calling the subject right, right, dependence. Right, right, right. Now, in the United States, I think, because of this historical background that we've been discussing, the small business class punches way above its weight. And the ideals associated with the small business class have tremendous attractive power in the society. So this, th this is then the basis, an ideological basis, for this idea of lifting up the rear guard right, right, huh? right. through these various forms of extension because it appeals to this sensibility. We don't want to be subsidized. We don't want the state, we don't want the government to choose the winners Right. Because if the government chooses the winners, the losers will end up choosing the government. We want there to be this system of democratization of access right. to productive resources and opportunities. Right. What that means today in the age of the knowledge economy has to be reinvented. We have to have a new idea. And part of that new idea has to be then the reorganization of the market order. Yes. Uh, Scott, I'm going to go back to something you said earlier in the lecture about uh, plantation owners being more powerful than legislation at mm -hmm. uh, state level, even federal level. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Mm -hmm. In 1884, the Chicago Board of Trade is established to start trading commodities. And moving through the end of the Civil War, it moves the price of cotton up to like 35, 36 cents a pound. And then through a series of uh, 30 short and put options by 1870, reduced it to 11 cents mm -hmm. per pound. Right at the time period when sharecroppers To what extent, prior to the war, did plantation owners understand their power of ownership of the plantation beyond their sphere and borders all the way across to England? They and under to Go what ahead. extent, after the war, did we just trade slave ownership in the South to slave ownership through trades in the North? Well, what, we, what happened is that we um, transform slave ownership in the South into serfdom in the South. So sharecroppers were, sh were sh uh, the vast majority of African Americans um, in the South after the Civil War were sharecroppers. And legal, technically, legally, they were serfs. They were tied to the land because in every state- Because of their debt burden. Because of their debt burden. Every state said, if you're African American and you have a debt, you cannot leave your county. You are tied to that land. So they were, uh, they were not chattel. They were not legally property. But they, were, they had no freedom in the sense that historically, in virtually all societies, freedom has meant, first and foremost, the freedom of mobility, the ability to move, to go from one place to another. They did not have that option. Um, and so it's, and in uh, the, uh, I mean, there's a long history of Southerners writing the story of, um, the, of the Civil War era and of the South that ignores what I've just said. Um, and, and, and understanding how trades happen on the commodities market, though, as, right. as, a, as a cropper, right? So if I was a white owner of land, right. um, I can release or hold So to that extent, were they, were they not still just slave owners by reducing the market value of cotton as I invest my money elsewhere? Uh, I mean, they reduced it in five years. They reduced it from 35, 36 cents to 11 cents a pound. Mm -hmm. And a 
five years before the war, it was only seven cents a pound. So it had drastically inflated right. the end of the war and then immediately plummeting after the war, limiting the amount that sharecroppers would make and then by virtue then what they had to afford to pay back in their debt uh, that they were slowly trying to pay off. And he limited that more or less. Yes, um, I can speak to that in a second, but you have a... Right, right. Um, so the first commodities in the futures market right, are the right, grains. So right. cotton never really had a huge enough share of the market in that regard to have an influence until you get the kind of rise in the mid 18th, 19th century with the big cotton plantations. But it is true. So one, it isn't just slavery or um, enslavement of now serfs. Like there is also now importation of what we call labor, right. right? They're pitting right. Chinese workers against right. African American um, sharecroppers, right? In the 1870s in West Georgia, right. they're also importing, or there's this huge massive movement, of course, labor throughout the Caribbean that some of these um, owners are now kind of involved in because they're expropriating all of their like productive power in that regard. Um, and it is also the case that during the Civil War, um, the Confederacy is in like direct negotiations with Great Britain and France yeah. to intervene. Yes. Um, on the basis, on the right. threat of withholding right. cotton shares. So I would s my sense of it is that the commodities market was not the avenue that they like, most directly exerted their power. Um, they, I think they exerted it over kind of throughout the era over much larger like foreign policy, like national level matters. Yes, that's that's right. That's right. And the and uh, before the war, Southerners were very aware of their power and their wealth. Um, in fact, um, in the after the 1850 census came out, the Massachusetts Abolition Center, Charles Sumner, essentially did a, an analysis of the census and um, counted up the wealthiest Americans. Um, and uh, without question, um, ninety percent of the wealth, a huge number of the wealth, was concentrated in the hands of fewer than a hundred very wealthy slave owners, and uh, and the really wealthy slave owners were essentially CEOs. They owned multiple plantations, and the CFO, chief operator, CEO, chief operating officer, they would appoint individuals to run each plantation and if they ran it well their pay would be higher and and because of the artisanal system in the north the disparities was truly extraordinary now those disparities were reduced after the uh, after the war for um, for a lot of reasons um, but the, uh, the sharecroppers uh, were, did not line the pockets of the masters in the way they had. And there was also in the 1870s and 80s um, uh, some uh, disease with uh, cotton and other crops. Uh, but it was still very much a kind of aristocracy of you have in the southern communities and counties one or two people who are huge landowners immense landowners, not nearly what they were in the antebellum period. Um, and it could be in cotton or it could be in rice or other um, commodities. Um, and it's, uh, it's a, um, it was, I mean, again, uh, during the war, the, the rebellion, the rebels, um, most of the money that they received was through from England and France and Europe. Um, and uh, there was an effort at a essentially reparations. And uh, actually Charles Sumner again argued that England um, should pay the United States billions of dollars because had they not traded with Southerners as much as they did, he argued the war would have been over and two years earlier or more. So it's, um, 
that's a, a long answer, but I, it's um, your to rebut um, your th this vision. Yes. Um, so, I guess my question is, um, if there isn't um, kind of a natural organization of the market order, which I agree with, um, I imagine you would also agree that there isn't a natural organization of the government. Um, but some organizations of governments are more, I guess, moral or ethical than other organizations of government. Right. I'm not here to make the case that the current market order is ethical or moral because it isn't, but I'm just curious, how do we structure future market orders to be better tailored to a more ethical or moral um, consumption, labor force, kind of like all the metrics we use um, in this class to discuss the formation of um, the American market order? I'm not sure I understand the question exactly. So what is what you're saying? What what should be the? What well, I understand that there's like not a natural formation of yes. market order. Yes. Um, but I guess because that's a, the the general normative question in politics. What are our objectives in political life? Uh, and uh, and of course we understand that differently depending whether we're right or left, right? Conservative or progressive. Uh, so I think I have to answer your question by saying how I would reinterpret the distinction between right and left. Uh, and I would say that it's not, it, we sh it's not a distinction between, in, in, in the contemporary form of the ideological debate, we think that the distinction is between those who prioritize freedom under the existing institutions, that's the right, and those who pri prioritize equality. Mm -hmm. The shallow equality versus shallow freedom, that's the conventional form of the ideological debate. Uh, that debate doesn't make sense and doesn't have transformative power. So I would say what truly distinguishes the right and the left is the following. First, the, the, the conservatives, the right, are the ones who believe that it's natural for human life to be small, except when there's war or there's, there's an elite of geniuses, of heroes, of saints, of entrepreneurs. <laughs> they, they do the great stuff. Huh? And then everyone else is down below, except when there are the sacrificial devotions of war and then people are taken out of the long littleness of life, they're taken out of their ruts. The leftist is the one who thinks it's, it's unnatural for human life to be small. But we, 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 we ascend only if we ascend together, uh, greatness together. Uh, and this is why I call deep freedom. Uh, it's not deep equality because the objective is not uh, a rigid equality of outcome or circumstance. So this is what the liberals and socialists thought in the 19th century. The true aim is not the humanization of society, it's the divinization of humanity. It's our rise to a higher level of empowerment and agency, shared. Huh? Uh, and the second distinction between the right and the left is that the right are the ones who believe that we should pursue our aims within the established institutional framework, the existing form of democracy, the existing form of the market, with little adjustment. And the, con the progressives or the left are the ones who believe that we can realize our ideals and interests only by transforming the institutions. We don't transform them by these big systemic changes, replacing one indivisible system by another, as the Marxists thought. We pursue them through structural change, which in its normal form is piecemeal or fragmentary. So under this way that I propose to distinguish the right from the left, the great majority of progressives are rightists because that's what the, con the institutional 
institutionally conservative social democracy is today the default position of the progressives. And it is on the right-hand side of this division between right and left, which I just described. So if you ask me what then is the aim, the aim is our shared empowerment. Uh, and pursued by the method of experimental, fragmentary, and cumulative institutional change. And that's what should orient our experiments with the market order. I need to leave um, just a few minutes early. We, we can stop. We don't have to continue, uh, John. Yeah, yeah, I told Roberta, I, I'm the head of the search committee that convenes at um, 3, so I have 10 minutes to get over there. Very good. Does someone else want to say something? So I'm, I'm happy to stay if you want to converse. If not, we can just adjourn. We all next week. Okay, thank you, John. Thank you. And we'll continue next week then.
this really well. Uh, no, I don't. I don't think you have. Um, but it, is it okay if I come at eleven a.m. tomorrow? That makes sense. I mean, given the, the blockade, you know, the Civil War, the cotton prices are going to skyrocket because there are limited supply chains. And when the war is over, even if you don't have rich plantation owners, you're going to need some money. That just sounds like a lot of anxiety. Uh -huh. it's, it's absolutely anxiety. I mean, it's, 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 the situation is obviously threatening to be a lot of um, religion going. Secondly, <laughs> 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 